Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are very excited to be here tonight, or hosting this uh, event with our good friends at the Institute of Politics. Uh, it's just our, uh, and we look forward to doing more events uh, with them in the future. So just to set the stage, there's a, we have an excellent uh, panel here. Uh, but I thought it would be useful just to start with the way that at the Energy Policy Institute we often think about uh, the global energy challenge. Uh, and we think of it as having really three features uh, or three goals, and that's part of what makes it so complicated and part of what I think leads to some of the polling results uh, that we're going to hear about. Uh, I think one goal, the first goal that people often have uh, for energy policy is, well, how do we have cheap and reliable access to energy? Uh, and that's an important goal, and it energy powers our lives and powers our economy. Uh, the second is, well, we would sure like to do that and not have uh, undesirable environmental consequences associated with the production or consumption of energy. Uh, how do we not have lots of air pollution? How do we not have health problems near the sites where we're producing energy? Uh, and uh, the third is, how can we prevent disruptive climate change? Uh, and so what I think comes across when you start to think about all three of those goals is it's hard to name a single policy that can hit all three of them. Uh, you can hit one sometimes, you can hit two sometimes, it's very, very difficult uh, to get one uh, that achieves all three. And so as I was just kind of going through the polling results, uh, two areas which I know uh, Steve and our uh, experts are going to talk about, uh, I think help illustrate this. One is how do people feel about hydraulic fracturing? Uh, so on the one hand, it's been stupendous in terms of reducing energy costs. Uh, some estimates are uh, American households are saving $100 billion per year. Uh, it's also upended international political relations in ways that have often been beneficial for the United States. Uh, and then at the same time, there have been lots of concerns about local environmental uh, issues and concerns. And so I think that that comes across, actually, I think, in a very interesting way with respect to the poll, uh, the results of poll questions that people at, or we asked about uh, how people felt about hydraulic fracturing. So 40 percent of the people had no opinion. Uh, among the people who had an opinion, two to one are against it. Uh, only 13 percent of Democrats are for it and 36 percent of Republicans. And so in the face of that, which I think reflects these conflicting goals, what can politicians do? Uh, and I think I hope we'll learn more about that uh, tonight. Uh, another example, of course, is climate change. Uh, disruptive climate change is considered by many to be an existential threat. It's, likely, it's projected to uh, increase mortality rates, increase crime, reduce crop yields, even affect test scores of uh, students. Uh, and so that's a great social concern. And at the same time, most of the paths we have to doing something about disruptive climate change or reducing the odds of cr climate change run through higher energy prices, and that's something that people don't uh, like as well. And so I think you can see then that for the political system, the challenge is quite complicated. Uh, Two-thirds of the people believe that government should do something uh, about climate change, yet 42 percent of households are unwilling to pay even one dollar a month. Uh, and so what we're, we'll be looking to our experts for tonight is uh, to try and navigate across the shoals of those three goals and the conflict and the indecision and contradictory opinions uh, that that seems to unleash in the American public. So uh, I'm thankful that I don't have to do that. <laughs> uh, and we're very fortunate and happy to have Steve Edwards here, uh, who is a giant in Chicago journalism and the director of the Institute, executive director of the Institute of Politics. Uh, and he's going to introduce our two guests. Thanks. Michael, thank you so much. Um, it's great to have all of you here. Our thanks uh, from the Institute of Politics to the entire EPIC team, to Michael and Sam and the rest of the crew for putting this together. Um, we're going to do a couple things tonight. The biggest is, as Michael alluded to, we're going to get deep into data that comes from this survey that EPIC did with AP NORC into how voters feel about some of these critical issues that he just referenced. Um, we do it broadly as uh, uh, reflective of the nation as a whole, and then breaking it down among Republicans and Democrats and independents in many cases. Um, we also will have a little bit of time for you to answer a few questions so we can get the tenor of the opinion in this room here. So a bit later, we'll instruct you on 
how you can use your mobile device to respond to a few polling questions. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, as we always do at IOP events, uh, we reserve time for you to ask questions of our guests during the audience Q&A. And we are very, very pleased to have two of the most respected public opinion pollsters in the country, uh, Mark Melman and Neil Newhouse. Mark Melman is the CEO of the Melman Group, a democratic principally consulting firm. He's also president of the American Association of Political Consultants. Neil Newhouse is a partner and co-founder of Public Opinion Strategies, uh, called by the New York Times, uh, the leading Republican polling company. The two of them, you'll love this, the two of them have each won pollster of the year three times. And, and we're not three. retired. <laughs> <laughs> three time winners of Pulsar of the Year. Um, please join me in thanking Neil Newhouse and Mark Melman for being here. Good to have you both. All right, so we prepared a few slides, and we're going to break these up into a couple of issues. So, our first issue set is going to look at climate change broadly speaking. And we'll put up our first slide here of data that you can see um, under policies to reduce carbon. And the first slide has to do with the percent of those who think that climate change is happening and that the government should act. As you can see on the screen here, there's several bits of data, but 65% of all Americans think that climate change is happening and the government should act. The bars immediately to your right break that down. 84% of Democrats believe so, whereas only 43% of Republicans think so. Um, and then we have a few points. I'll read them for those of you in the back. Eight in 10 Americans believe that climate change is happening. 65% um, believe, as I said before, that both climate change is happening and the government should do something in response. Um, and as I said, the intensity gap and support uh, between Democrats and Republicans is pretty significant. So Mark Melman, as you look at this, what stands out to you? How does this relate to what you have come to understand from voters across the country? <clears throat> thanks, and thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, let me make maybe three points about this. First, um, pollsters, we can't help deal, but deal with like the concrete specifics of the question. Uh, one of the things you find in research on this topic is it's not always clear what you're looking at. So, for example, when you ask people about climate change, a lot of people think you mean it was warm yesterday and today it's cooler. It was raining last week, this week it's sunny. That's climate change for a lot of people. So is it happening? You bet, it happens every couple of days, uh, <laughs> sometimes every day. Um, so, the, you know, when you talk about climate change that's caused by human beings, that's already a different level. When you talk about climate change as a, as a negative force, uh, that's also something different. Global warming, also something different. So first of all, important to understand, it's not always clear what you're looking at. Second, um, there was a time, I actually remember this time, uh, in the early 90s, late 80s, when we were first looking at this issue, when there was very little partisan split on this issue. Democrats, Republicans, Independents were all pretty similar. Uh, but there was a point we actually did some work uh, for a Pew uh, entity uh, interviewing uh, Republican and Democratic members of Congress and their staffs. Bottom line is at a certain point, it became clear to Republicans, I shouldn't say, it, it, Republicans began to believe that climate change, global warming, was Al Gore's political strategy to get himself elected in 2000, okay? That's what it came to mean. It was not about changes in the environment. It was not about changes in the climate. It was not about the earth warming. It was about Al Gore getting himself elected. And at that point, Republicans turned in a massive way against this. You may not know if you will remember this, but there were actually commercials on TV with Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi sitting on the same couch talking about the importance of dealing with global warming. This was truly a bipartisan issue. But at a certain point, it became so identified with Al Gore and so identified with his presidential ambitions that Republicans turned against it, Republican leadership turned against it, and it became a great example of followers following leaders. That is, of voters changing their views on a subject to line up with their leaders. Their leaders changed, so did they, and that's why we see what we see here. Neil, what's your take on that same phenomenon? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. My pleasure. Um, and thank you for, uh, I, I think Mark and I are kind of are speechless without having a PowerPoint to respond to, because <laughs> all, all of our presentations are PowerPoints, but I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'll give you the slide uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, I'll, I'll have a control of that, <laughs> I know. Um, I can't believe he didn't lead with 
with uh, the tweet from my party's nominee, um, which is, the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. I mean, I think we all agree with that, right? <laughs> 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 all right. Um, much like what uh, Mark said, it, it, a lot of it depends on how the question is asked and what question you do ask. Um, climate change is happening. When you go deeper in the data and look at some of the other uh, the, the polls that are done, about half those people agree, say, yeah, and humans are causing it. Another half say, it is happening, but I'm not sure what's causing it. It's just the earth warming. And then the other third say, ah, hell no, it's not happening. And then when you ask the question, should the government do something about it? There is agreement, but there's, but what, there's no agreement in terms of what that means what the government should do. The government should act. What does that mean? They provide incentives. Does that mean they, uh, they, they put m new regulations out? And I, I respond to what Mark said in terms of, uh, I think Al Gore, you're exactly right. But it goes deeper than that in terms of how re Republicans respond to this, because Republicans generally object um, to more government regulation. And to, and to Republicans, this means, oh, no, no, you're going to regulate this even more? I, I, I'm not in favor of this. Um, and it's going to cost me more money? I'm not in favor of it. So they agree that something's happening. They're not sure what, what the answer is. And that's why when you, when you ask the question about, you know, what about, would you pay a dollar a month? Uh, the numbers basically are almost cut in half in terms of people who, uh, uh, who want, to, want to see action on this. You talked to both of you about the importance of how the question is framed. Yeah. What about how the terms that we're using, right? So for a while we talked about global warming, now we're talking about global climate change. What difference does the framing of the actual issue or the language around it, beyond just a specific question, have in the way parties and voters respond? Um, you got to keep in mind, most of the stuff that Mark and I do is, is still done by telephone. We, still do, we do a lot of work online, but, but a lot of it's still on telephone. And all they hear is climate change or global warming. And the re initial response is a lot like Mark said, which is, are you talking about the weather change? And, and it, there, without a context, without setting a context, without, without writing an introductory paragraph or something, you know, something more, um, it, it loses its context here. And I think that you need to frame these issues when you, when you ask questions about it so that people understand what it is you're talking about. Otherwise, you're, gonna, you're not going to get uh, you know, true answers. You know, when we started working on this uh, those many years ago, um, one of the things we found, as I said, is that people, when they heard climate change, they thought about the changing weather. <clears throat> when they heard global warming, they thought about something completely different. Uh, they thought about something that was human-caused, anthropogenic. They didn't use that word, however. Um, neither did I then. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and something that was dangerous and threatening. Climate change was benign. It's just the change in the weather. Global warming sounded more uh, ominous, ominous or, yeah, more yeah. hostile, yeah. more problematic. Um, I will say we found over time, uh, as the issue has ripened and matured, that difference has become less and less. That is, people uh, use them more interchangeably than they used to. But there's still evidence that people, while they use them more or less interchangeably, still see global warming as something that's more ominous and more likely to be caused by humans. I want to move on to uh, our other slides and our other sections, but let me come back to you, Neil, really quickly to go back to kind of the fundamental complexity, as, as you described it at least, with how Republican voters tend to view these issues, both the issue as a whole and then the government response and what's causing and so forth. So if you were to advise uh, the political class in your party or in Washington as a whole um, on how to frame these issues in ways that could build consensus around some policy proposals, where would you turn? Where would you go? Um, I think you start with expanding clean energy. I, I, I think you, you start it from a little different direction. Um, clean, expanding clean energy helps the environment, reduces dependence on, on foreign oil, um, it, it helps, it, it, it protects people's health. I, th I think you, you start with expanding clean energy, and that could be, you know, that's, that's almost like a, it's the all the above energy policy. Um, but I think you start with that. You, and one of the things that's not in here, and we, have, we never talked about before our meetings, um, nuclear. I mean, I, I, even nuclear should be a part of this. Nuclear is 20% tw of the energy produced in the, in the country, and yet 63% of the emission free uh, uh, energy. It's just, it's, 
you know, there are things like that. We've, we've got to uh, open our minds in terms of other alternatives. But I would start on our side with uh, we're talking about clean energy because people are in favor of that. And, and the more you link that to reducing dependence on foreign oil, uh, the more you're going to get traction in our party. Within the Republican Party. And how about you, Mark? What would you say to Democrats who are trying to move forward on this issue but run into roadblocks, not just from Republicans, but to others within their party who have regional interests that may conflict with the kind of agenda that's being discussed? Sure. Well, I, Neil's absolutely right. Clean energy is an extraordinarily strong way to talk about this. Uh, people see that as a job creator. They see it as uh, creating independence uh, from, uh, from foreign energy sources. All those are very positive things as far as they're concerned. Um, you know, the other thing that's important here is, and people are not, I mean, I spent years trying to learn how to pronounce dengue fever, okay? Now it's actually in the newspaper. You know, when we, again, started to work on this issue and people said, well, dengue fever's come to the United States, nobody cared. Uh, and when you talk, because no one knew what it was, including me. Um, when, when we talked about sea level rise, we did this in Florida and people said, you know, that's great because those rich people live on the ocean they're going to be gone. I'm going to have the oceanfront property. Good yeah. deal. I mean, like people were just not, you know, afraid of this in particular. But when you talk about instead of the consequences of global warming or climate change, talk about it as a consequence, you're in much stronger ground. So if you talk about reducing the carbon pollution that causes global warming, language that, again we developed back in the in the late '80s, people are all of a sudden look at it in a very different way. It's framed in a very different way. People, now, it's cheating a little bit because I just created that carbon pollution that causes global warming, <laughs> right? So it's CO2. It's not what people sort of think it is, but what people think it is is the black stuff coming out of the back of a bus uh, or from a smokestack, and they think that's harmful. So again, there are lots of different ways to talk about this issue that engage people more, but I will say just two other comments if I can. Yeah. First, the very name is off-putting. Like, when you talk about global, you talk about climate change, I mean, the reality is people say there's nothing more disengaging than saying this is a global problem that you have to solve. Okay, like, forget it. Yeah. There's nothing I can do as an individual. Just the this enormity is a of, the, of the, size, the scale of it. Yeah. Size and scope. We're talking about the climate. We're talking about the global. None of these things really engage people. Second, we are very much hardwired to, to deal with concepts that we actually can deal with that we can choose about so like I know that I don't like peanut that I do like peanut butter and jelly and I don't like eggplant because I have to decide every day whether to eat the peanut butter and jelly or to eat the eggplant or both and so I have an opinion on those things I don't have to have an opinion on climate change because there's no choice I have to make on a daily basis it doesn't impact what I do so there's much less incentive for my brain or anyone else's brain to really wrap them so there it self around these issues. The but other thing, go ahead. With, with, uh, the other thing is, going back to that, the idea of clean energy, the other, the other thing that hits me, uh, there was a poll, that, uh, Gallup poll did a, uh, Gallup did a survey in March. Do you think global warming will pose a serious threat to you or your way of life in your lifetime? 57% said no. There's no connection. If it's, if it's not going to impact me, then what the hell do I have to worry about? Um, it may impact my kids, my, you know, it, but it doesn't impact me. I think if you focus on global warming as, I mean, and, and make that the focus, you're losing the point of, of you know, focusing on, on, on clean energy, something people can actually do something about. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it, it brings it closer to home. There have also been studies that suggest that just most, many humans are just, we're not hardwired to respond to stimuli that's not immediate, which is in some respects what you're both getting yeah. at, right? Yeah, that we, we that the abstract, the right, we discount the future cost. For good reason. Yeah, okay. yeah. For the we should part. bring Michael back up to talk about the economics of that. <laughs> um, but speaking of economics, let me go to another slide here, um, if I can do so. Um, doesn't, let's see, oh, here we go, sorry. Um, what is your willingness to pay a fee to combat climate change? Um, and the idea here is that you would have options of different fees to pay. So on the whole, uh, more than half of Americans would pay a buck a month on their electricity bill to fund government policy on climate change. Um, and 42% uh, would be unwilling to pay anything overall. And party affiliation, more than income or education or geographic region, was the strongest determinant of your point of view on this. So, and you can see those bars suggest the dollar amount. So within Republican 
uh, voters and among Democratic voters, you saw obviously um, expected highest support for the one dollar and then a significant increase between Democrats. How much of this is about climate change and how much of this is just about uh, views of the, the role of government and the role of uh, fiscal decision making? And, yes. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Republicans are asked, um, would, you, would you raise taxes, is what you're saying, raise taxes to combat climate change, to have the government cl combat climate change. We're living in a period where Americans distrust their government at a, at a greater rate than at any point in time, even including Watergate and the Vietnam War. The, so, the polling data today is, shows that in sharper relief than, than those two periods. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. by significant margins. Mm -hmm. And so I want to give, give more money to the government to do something co to combat this amorphous issue, com uh, climate change. Uh, the Republicans are like, I, I don't think so. It's, it's, I'm, I'm willing to do something to do it, but I'm raising taxes to do it for an amorphous issue and there are no specifics, and you're gonna let Congress spend this money? Congress has a 14% approval rating? Uh, you know, lots of, lots of warning signs in there. All right. Well, and I would just add that, you know, look, a dollar from Democrats, I mean, when you walk into Safeway, is a dollar for this cause or that cause. So we always say yes to that, we're suckers. <laughs> but the truth is, it is for a specific cause, at least. Here, again, if you said to people, would you pay a dollar if, or two dollars or ten dollars to develop clean energy or to expand, you know, clean energy projects or to do a myriad of other things that might actually affect global warming, you'd get a very different answer than just asking people if you'd pay money to combat, uh, to fund government policy on climate change. People are much more willing to pay for something specific and concrete than they are for something generic. And it goes back to climate change. I'm, I'm not gonna be affected in my lifetime. Why the hell do I have to worry about it? Yeah. But clean energy, yeah, I'd, I'd do that. All right, let's move on to our second topic. I'm sure there are a lot of questions about what's been said, so keep those questions, and then we'll give you a chance to pose them to our pollsters. The idea here, in, in all cases, is we're trying to understand what voters are thinking about this. And for those of you that care passionately about these issues, as I know so many of you do, what are the strategies that might be employed practically, politically, and otherwise to um, create new openings to, uh, to this issue? So on fracturing, um, more commonly known as fracking, we have a couple of interesting things going on here. So Michael alluded to this in the introduction. The fact is that the vast majority of Americans um, don't know the degree to which fracking is actually contributing to the U.S. domestic energy output. In fact, um, two-thirds of U.S. gas is provided through this process today. Um, less than a quarter, barely a fifth of Americans um, identified that amount correctly. Um, we also have in the second bullet point on the right here, um, only 40 percent of Americans um, really have a, a, an opinion about fracking, whether it is good or bad. Um, it is more positive among Republican voters than it is among Democrats. And in fact, the intensity of opposition among Democrats is, is more um, significant. So on this particular issue of fracking, I'm interested in a couple of things, particularly the way in which um, partisan divides, but also geographic divides may, may cut this. Um, what role does geography play in the larger conversation around energy in the United States today? Well, first, let me just do my own little poll here for a second. How many people like high fructose corn syrup? Hmm. How many people like natural corn sweetener? Okay, come on, somebody does. Well, you are not normal because most people don't like uh, uh, high fructose corn syrup, but natural corn sweetener is very positive, gets a very positive reaction. One of my contributions to society is going to be changing that name. Um, <laughs> I work for Coca-Cola, and that's one of my, my great contributions to Coca-Cola. You'll see it, bottles coming, coming soon. Coming soon, but, your stories. Um, anyway, the, the, people aren't going to like hydraulic fracturing either. They have the slightest idea what it is. Most people don't. Um, but it doesn't sound very nice. It doesn't sound very pleasant. It doesn't sound like a good thing. Believe me, most of these people who are offering an opinion haven't the slightest idea what's being talked about. And if you go to places where they do frack, fracking, if you go to Colorado, for example, where it's a major industry, if you go to parts of Pennsylvania and Ohio where it's a major industry, you'll find very different kinds of attitudes where people know more about it and they actually tend to be somewhat more favorably disposed to it. That's not to say that they don't have problems. They do. There's lots of things they'd like to change. They'd like to avoid the earthquakes in Ohio and they'd like to avoid the big machines rolling down the road and sitting in, uh, in view in Colorado. But 
nonetheless, people in these places tend to favor it. So again, the geography, what's happening in your geography can make a very big difference. What's your read on this data, Neil? Um, just a, a little backstory first. Um, it was no more than two or three years ago, I was doing some work in, I think, Ohio and, and on a conference call with people uh, talking about different issues and I raised the issue of fracking. And there were two people on the phone who had no idea what the hell I was even talking about. It's just, it, it is, it's, it's new to, to many Americans. Um, voters are, are very strongly divided on this issue. It's, a, it's in local communities, look for local communities, it's jobs and revenue and money. Um, but it's also causing hardships with respect to some, co you know, some problems with the environment. But then if you, if you are going to, if you can tie fracking and the, result, and the, the benefits of fracking into one reason why we have lower dependence on foreign oil, lower gas prices, and, other, you know, and lower energy prices overall, which I don't think we, we've done in most of the polling I've seen, it's going to be a much more dead even issue. It, this, is a, this is an issue that, that is nowhere near maturity in terms of, of public opinion, and it's, going to, it's really going to divide Americans across the board. When you say maturity and public opinion, what do you mean by that? Um, most Americans still haven't heard about it. Yeah. I mean, with the exception, I mean, it's, Which you know, this poll suggests, yeah, it's, low it's southern, southern tier New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, I mean, it's, it's but once, uh, Americans, Americans really aren't sure why we're paying lower gas prices and, and why the country has become, uh, there, there's no awareness the country has become uh, a net exporter of, of petroleum. There, there's, you know, there's, there's a sense that we're doing better, but no reason, no, no causation to that. Um, and yet you have, you know, Governor uh, Kasich in Ohio, I mean, have been a big proponent of, of fracking. Um, this, is, this is an issue that's, that is, uh, we're going to be dealing with the next 20 years. Let me pull out slightly from beyond um, the question of fracking and ask a question just around yeah. fuel prices. You guys have been um, surveying voters for years, analyzing. We've seen fuel prices go up and down. Um, what impact do fuel costs, particularly gas prices, have on voters' perceptions of the health of the economy and their own income? It's huge. I mean, let me assure you, vote, voters aren't looking at the stock market every day to figure out how the hell the economy is going. They're looking at gas prices. And when we do our work among uh, um, focus groups like Walmart moms or voters who are living on the financial edge, they're worried about, they're not worried about what Washington, D.C. is doing with respect to you know, sequestration or anything else. They're worried about how much money it's going to cost to fill up their SUV versus buy soccer cleats for the kids. Um, there was, in 2000, as recently as 2012, 70% of Americans thought it was likely they would pay $5 a gallon in gas that year. That was four years ago, and now we're paying, to what, 220 I mean, it's, it, it drives attitudes toward how things are going in, and, just, and it is immediate. To Amer Americans fill up once a week or once every 10 days and they get that immediate reinforcement at the gas station, how much they're paying, and, it, and they have to pay it immediately. It's out of pocket. There are some people who are concerned that actually the lower gas prices will not only erode public support, um, but also will disincentivize industry and government as a whole to kind of keep the heat on some of these larger questions yeah. about shifting the energy output and shifting the policy priorities in response to um, global warming and climate change. W what evidence, if any, do you see uh, American attitudes softening in the wake of lower gas prices right now on any of these questions? Well, uh, certainly there's, there's a whole set of economic incentives yeah. that other people would be better able to describe. But let's put it this way. When, when we talk about electric vehicles, for example, people are very, very clear in saying, if gas costs more, I'm going to be more interested in an electric vehicle. If gas costs less, I'm less interested in an electric vehicle. People get that. They're very clear about it. And that's just one example, but I think a reasonable well, one. And uh, support for fracking has actually, and some of the Gallup data or Pew data, support for fracking has gone down in the past year, and they link it to lower gas price, lower energy costs. And so their support's gone down because costs have down, gone down, and yet costs have down, gone down partially because of fracking. Um, for all of these issues, and, and I'll make a transition to fossil fuels, broadly speaking, as we go to our, our next slides. And before we jump into the data here, um, here we are in a presidential election year, and as has been the case for uh, cycles as long as I can remember, at least in, in recent cycles, 
we're, you know, we're focused on about a dozen battleground states. We're focused um, you know, on the Ohio's and Pennsylvania's of the world in particular, who have unique relationships to these energy questions. What impact does a, a, a focus on battleground states have on elevating or suppressing um, the role that energy and environmental questions play in our debate? Barely mentioned at all last night. I, I can't recall it being mentioned. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, you look at Pennsylvania and Ohio, it plays a very significant role. I mean, that su the, the southern, uh, southwestern Ohio um, borders West Virginia, um, it's coal country, Pennsylvania, uh, western PA. Um, what's interesting is the anti-coal anti regulations uh, put in by the Obama administration, uh, the sentiment is so strong in those areas, it is, it's almost a single issue uh, vote. And you're going you're gonna to see, um, and, and you, all you, you need to go back to 2014 and look at what Shelley Moore Capito did in West Virginia, look at Mitch McConnell did in Kentucky, um, and just in the races that were run there and how, what the, the role that coal played in terms of uh, kind of protecting the interests of the state. Uh, it's a very parochial issue, and it'll play this year. And it'll, it'll, it'll play towards Trump's advantage. What's your read on that same dynamic? Well, um, I certainly agree with what Neil said. You know, in terms of the, the presidential politics and battleground states, most of the uh, old energy production, if you will, is in non-battleground states. Mm -hmm. At this point, at least, Texas, Oklahoma, Alaska. Uh, these are not battleground states, and frankly, Kentucky and West Virginia aren't anymore mm -hmm. either. Um, you know, it is amazing to look at some of those uh, parts of Kentucky, parts of West Virginia, w that not too long ago, you have counties that were voting essentially 80-20 yeah. Democratic, and now they're voting 10-90 Republican. Um, and it's importantly, as Neil said, because they feel the Obama administration, wrongly in my view, but they feel the Obama administration has been responsible for decimating their entire way of life, not just taking people out of the mines, but when you have a whole communities and whole regions that are based on these jobs and this economy, it, it's really the whole infrastructure of life is, is destroyed uh, in many of these areas, and people are understandably angry about it. They don't, they don't understand the role of natural gas and other uh, competitive forces, what's happening overseas in that. They just see it as sort of focused it's on kind of EPA. binary. There's a trade-off. That you do one, you lose the other. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you have some newer uh, battleground states, people, places like uh, Colorado, Nevada, where New Mexico, where clean energy is a very big issue, very important issue. Um, so Again, you, see, you do see some discussion yeah. of clean energy as a result of the battleground. I, I want to dig more deeply into this, this jobs energy tension that, that you both talked about. We can see some evidence of that just in this survey data here. If you look at the third point um, on the right-hand side of the screen, I'll read it for those who can't. Um, if respondents are told um, rules to restrict coal use will, quote, result in the loss of thousands of coal jobs. Support changes sharply for Republicans. So it drops significantly. Those are the red bars in the middle. So the lighter colored bar is when you are told that uh, measures will cost thousands of coal jobs. And you can see that um, Democrats, it's, it's, there's no change, at least according to this survey. Um, significant change, Republicans, uh, among Republicans, and um, slight change from independents yeah, but, but to- Yeah, Steve, look at those numbers among independents. Yeah. 20, it starts at 35% support, support among independents. That's lower than Republicans. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's the key. I mean, you know what? If I'm running a campaign, I don't care what the hell the Democrats are doing. 67%, that's great. All I need is R's and I's on my side, and I've got a great wedge issue. And if I can, if I can pull some Democrats over, that's fine. But you look, the, to me, the key number there are those independent voters. And that's, that's overwhelming for me. That, 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 to me, indicates there's real opportunity to, make, uh, to bring this issue down based on jobs. Yeah. Agree. <laughs> I mean, we've got two guys here that work on opposite sides of the aisle, and you see this the same the way. Facts it's it's well, unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it's like <laughs> facts are facts. We're, not, not what's going Trump, on in a political climate? <laughs> um, you know, we've, we've, more than half of Americans overall would favor federal regulations um, as the macro um, fifty-four percent number, but I think as you point out, it gets much more interesting as we break it down. But, but so even fifty-four percent, 
That's not, I mean, you'd look for um, a consensus issue to be s over 60. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, 54% is not going to, uh, no, that, 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 that's not going to win. You have to win the election, but 54% is, is not high enough on an issue uh, that you can take that to the bank. You've got to be, you've got to be above 60. Easily for for you to want to be able to feel comfortable campaigning on that issue yeah. and winning support, and depending on what these demographics look like. But yeah, I, but yeah. again, this depends very much on on, on where on, as well. Yeah. So I mean, obviously Republicans, pretty much everywhere. But if if you go to Kentucky, this looks a lot different than if you are in Nevada, for yeah. example. Yeah. I, I want to move on to the international context for this, but before we do, um, so we've talked it and we're looking at the evidence of this economic impact, environmental impact kind of trade-off. Um, based on other data that you've seen, um, how might you approach and, and blunt that argument if that were the argument you're up against? That, hey, by doing these policies, you're gonna cost jobs. You come back to clean energy. Um, how, how do you do it in the context of the massive disruption that, that people in many of the communities that we've already alluded to um, feel or are, are potentially fearing in the wake of this kind of economic and energy transition? Well, look, I mean, people eschew trade-offs. People don't like trade-offs. They don't like to make trade-offs. They usually don't think they're necessary. Um, for many, many years, uh, a question was that still is asked on polls says, you know, which are you more worried about, you know, protecting the environment or protecting jobs? Yeah. And you know what? You ask people a question, they'll give you an answer. And sometimes they're a little bit more concerned about jobs, sometimes they're a little more concerned about the environment. You sit in a focus group and ask people this question, they say like, okay, why are you asking me that question? What does that mean? Like, you could ask me about protecting jobs versus education too, or whatever. There's an implicit assumption among the people that wrote the question that there is a trade-off uh, between those yeah. two things. That trade-off does not exist for most voters. So in general, if you say to people, which is more important, protecting jobs, protecting the environment, or don't you see a conflict between the two, you'll find a majority, a vast majority, saying, I don't see any conflict between the two. And so if you start from that presumption that there is no conflict, and you talk about ways to grow jobs, other ways to grow jobs, and grow jobs alternative energy, et cetera, et cetera, there's lots of ways to, to take that argument. But you don't have to accept the, the implicit trade-off that, uh, that and, elites assume and, and exists. Yet when you do the trade-off, um, recent data shows people in support of the environment more than more than jobs. If you were then to make it specific, your job, <laughs> that that would change things probably just a bit. Jobs in general, yeah, fine. But your job, uh, your job, okay, that that's different. Yeah. But it's um, yeah. What Mark's getting at is is people either fortunately or unfortunately answer the question you ask them, and sometimes you don't. We don't always ask them the right question. Right, right. And if you give them a choice and they're forced to make a choice, they will do that, which may not leave open the possibility that there could be um, a yes and. All right, let's go to um, international action on climate change. Um, so this is kind of interesting. This is confidence levels in the United States fulfilling its international commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the green bar um, are those who are very confident um, these are all Americans responding. So 26% are very confident that the United States will fulfill its commitments. 7% are very confident that China will fulfill its commitments. 6%, uh, if I can read that accurately, um, are very confident that India will fulfill its, fulfill its commitments. So you can see that. The, the, the non-confidence um, rates are significantly higher for China and India, of course. And despite all of that, um, Significant majorities of Americans believe that the U.S. should continue to make progress even if other countries fail, um, and there's strong bipartisan support. So when you look at this, um, what does that tell you, Mark Melman, about um, either energy policy or foreign policy? <laughs> because if you don't like the Chinese, um, <laughs> which they don't, um, but Look, the, the re reality is people are very suspicious about whether other countries are going to fulfill their obligations. There's an assumption that the United States always fulfills its obligations. Um, okay, accurate or inaccurate, but that's the assumption that, that Americans make. Um, but ultimately, people say, again, this is a, a little more complicated at the end of the day. Ultimately, people say, on the one hand, we should be world leaders. We should do the right thing, even if other people don't do the right thing. 
Um, and so that's why you get the numbers you get here. If you were to make a different kind of argument to people that it won't make any difference and it'll be a disadvantage to us in the world if we, do, if we take these steps and China and India and other countries don't, you'd find, again, some somewhat different responses. Is, isn't that, isn't that what G Gary Johnson said? Gary, I mean, the libertarian. I, I haven't nominee. followed each of his no, comments. I, I, no, no. I, <laughs> well, besides the one, I'm not going to smoke marijuana in the White House. Besides <laughs> that one, um, I think a couple, you know, a couple years ago, he's basically quoted as, "Why, why the hell are we dealing with, with stuff? Because in the long run, we're all going to be dead anyway." It was, it was one of those. It was, it was like, it was, it, it, it was seriously, it was that kind of it comment. What Mark says is exactly right here. I mean, number one, I don't think pe people believe the you know, U.S. has the best interests at heart, but they're not always going to follow through. They don't believe, you know, India or China. I mean, they, they've seen the, the pictures of the, of the plants, of the pollution. There's not a chance in hell they think they're, they're going to follow through on this stuff. Yeah, but all of this also begs the question for just how durable uh, support not only within this country is, but globally for the kinds of international climate agreements that we're talking about. Well, I mean, here. truthfully, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to come from the Chinese people, of the Indian people. I mean, and you've, you've seen some evidence of that already in terms of some uprising, some you know the, the complaints about water quality. It's, air quality, yeah. It's going to start with water quality and air quality. That's where it's going to start in these other countries, not climate change, air and water, because that's what people people have to breathe air and they've got to drink water. And those are the most immediate. When you ask people what the most important environmental problems facing the country, it goes to water and air first. Climate change, global warming is way down the road, but water and air, and that's where it's going to have to start in, in those countries. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know uh, from time to time you've done work abroad. Um, and it's, it's commonly believed that American attitudes, like American politics, sort of lag behind uh, the popular support that, say, countries in Europe exhibit when it comes to uh, the questions around climate change. W what do you know, if anything, about what the data really suggests there? That that's true? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, in, uh, Europeans... And significantly so? Like significantly so. Yeah. Europeans are much more, uh, Europeans in general, if we can still call Europe a place, um, m are much more likely to believe that, uh, that global warming is real, that it's harmful, that it's caused by humans, um, that something needs to be done about it. On all of those indicia, Europeans are in a different place. Um, when it comes to other countries in the world, frankly, I know far less about it um, because it's not really on the, it's only on the agenda of those countries because it's on the agenda of a U.S. administration and European administrations that are on which those, some of those countries feel uh, dependent economically, diplomatically, otherwise. And so they say, of course, we're committed to this, um, but it's not, I don't think it's rising from the public. All right, I want to move on to get your reactions to a few key questions. Neil, anything you wanted to add before we jump to that? Um, the only other thing would be, Third world countries have so many other problems to worry about that uh, you know, global warming, climate change, environment, are, are, I mean, they're, they're trying to feed their people. So it's, yeah. it, it obviously is a lesser priority. All right, so let's move on to um, polling. Um, we'll do, we have a couple of questions here. Some of you may have already responded through your program. So um, are candidates' views on, the cl on climate change and energy a major factor in your decision on whom to vote for? Um, you can text using the code 981557, your response, yes or no. Um, how important are candidates' views on climate and energy policy? Now, Mark and I did not do these questions. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, uh, I want to stay with this for just a second as a few of you vote. So that percentage is, is increasing. So we are fluctuating between 83 and 93 percent on how important this is on the decision that you'll make at the ballot box. So um, this will continue to evolve. We're seeing, though, a, a significant majority, overwhelming majority in this room as that number goes up. Um, beyond sort of any critique you <laughs> might have of the question. Shocking numbers. Um, <laughs> I want, here, here's the question I would ask first is, um, you have said, uh, in fact, as we were talking before we did this conversation, that this is just not a big issue on the radar screen of most Americans nationwide. Why is that? Well, for a lot of the reasons we discussed. People discount the future. They don't understand how they can yeah. contribute one way or another to it. Um, they see it as uh, uh, too big 
uh, to be engaged. So for a whole host of reasons, it's just not of moment uh, or as of great moment to people. I should have and asked a different question then. The, where, where does it rank, you know, broadly speaking? Well, and by the same token, there are other things that are much more yeah. important, um, that are much more immediate, whether it's the economy, terrorism, et cetera. Um, but y you have to be a little bit cautious about these rankings, I think. Um, because, look, we hear this all the time. Nobody can, you know, what's the most important problem? Nobody's mentioning climate change. Nobody's mentioning environmental issues. Uh, therefore, nobody cares. That's not really true. I mean, by that logic, abortion has never been an issue yeah. in an American election. By that logic, taxes have never been an important issue in an American election. Um, because when you ask people what's the most important problem facing the country, even fewer people say abortion or taxes uh, than say uh, climate change for the most part. So um, the reality is it's not the most important issue, but it is something that people do care about. But when you get to presidential voting and congressional voting and so on and so forth, there's so many other factors, uh, partisanship most important of all, that sort of washes out most every specific issue. But yeah, let me give you a couple of examples. I mean, a Bloomberg poll done just recently, most important problem facing the country, ISIS was at 21 percent. I mean, it's like, here's what you're up against. You're up against, I, you're up against life or death ISIS attacking us, terrorism, which could be you know, domestic terrorism, income decline, unemployment and jobs, health care, deficit, immigration, and then climate change at 5%. I mean, it's, a, it's still, it's at 5%, and in a number of polls, it's anywhere between 5 and 7%, or between that and environment, maybe energy. But when you've got, when you've just finished an eight-year recession, when we're being threatened domestically and foreignly in, in uh, uh, foreign territory by, by uh, you know, terrorists to some extent, um, when healthcare is an issue, education, I mean, climate change kind of falls to the bottom here. I mean, in terms of, of immediate concerns. That's why um, it really hasn't been the, the topic of much discussion. But it, not to say, as Mark says, yeah, there's abortion in this stuff, but yet it's a key, uh, a key uh, voting issue. <laughs> Look at Ohio. Ohio, your home state, state I do a lot of work in, Rob Portman. Um, Rob Portman's focused on the opioid issue, the heroin issue there. It has not, doesn't show up nationally in the poll, but you do focus groups in Ohio, you, you talk to people there, it's a huge issue in that state, it's a vote determining issue in Ohio right now, what, one small issue because they've, they've, they've focused on that issue. Yeah. So it's not to say this issue can't, can't be there, but not the way it's positioned right now. I see we've talked some of you into lowering your the importance you attach to it already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, the next question. Um, 981557, 981557. Um, you can text to um, express your opinion here. Do you believe energy and climate change have really received enough attention in the 2016 election? Very similar. So the vast majority say no. I think we've talked a little bit about Steve. Isn't this like the isn't this, this like the polls we, that were done last night after you know who won the debate? We're going to ask that too. <laughs> no, we, we, I'm sure some people may ask about it in the Q and A. So let's move on to the uh, let's move on to the next question here. Um, the the final question, if you can slide over. All right, um, and then we asked the same question that was polled. Um, to other Americans um, in the AP NORC poll, um, would you be in favor of a monthly fee on your electric bill to combat, combat climate change? And um, we're actually seeing, I don't have the slide in front of me, but I think we're actually seeing stronger support for the higher surcharge than we saw in the survey data we presented. So if you look, um, a third nearly would say, yes, I would do 10 bucks. and. Uh, and a quarter of you would, would be willing to go up for, uh, for 20 bucks in that. So interesting reads and inside And how many of the 20 bucks people would be spending their own money <laughs> as opposed to their, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so strong support. So let's pause here. Um, we have a microphone set up in the middle of the room. For those of you who have questions about all of this, um, we invite you to line up behind the microphone. We ask that you keep your questions shortened to the point and make it a question so that we can get to as many of you as possible on this. And uh, we will begin with you, sir, please. So given the complexity of the issue as described and the following behavior of most voters uh, relative to the elites that they consider important, why do we care what the average American thinks before <laughs> elites have decided they want to change their minds? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, 
you care about them because their politicians are unlikely to move on this issue unless the people are, are, are asking for it. That I mean, there's a, politicians are responsive to their political basis. They, they are good listeners, if nothing else. And they hear what, what issues people are talking about. And if it's, you know, if it comes up from the grassroots in their communities, their states, their CDs, um, they'll pay attention to it. it it's, it's not just driven by, uh, by opinion or leaks. Mark? I mean, okay. You don't have to care. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I, I went to a presentation uh, given by Professor Michael Greenstone, and uh, fortunately he is here. And there he, he studied the global energy inequality in certain countries, like uh, India, there is uh, Eastern State in India, Bihar, and the estimated energy consumption per person is only 122 kilowatt an hour. And for the whole India is about 684 or something, and for China is uh, 3,000, and for the United States is over 13,000. I'm gonna ask so that you move on, or just to your, the, the question point of your question, is, because we have a long there line behind a you. trade-off between this global energy inequality and the willingness to curb the climate change? If there is, what policy could be made to close the gap? Well, th look, there, there is a, a big issue here. I remember years ago we did a project where, uh, before the Cairo Population Conference, we went around and interviewed elites all over the world about this issue. And I remember someone in the French Foreign Ministry saying to me, essentially, what are we going to do when everyone in China has a car? I mean, the pollution will be incredible. It'll be un we, we, the world won't be able to deal with it. Um, so th there, is, there are inequities here. And the truth is, there are very few Americans who are going to be willing to go to uh, the, the state you mentioned in India, or even what uh, China is, uh, is doing on a per capita basis in terms of energy. People are not willing to lower their consumption by that amount. Americans are also what I call techno-optimists. People believe technology can solve any problem. Now, they may be right or wrong in that assessment, but that is their general assessment. So what people, Americans believe is they don't have to reduce their consumption in huge ways that are really going to uh, uh, imperil their lifestyle, but rather there's some technological fix that will allow them to live their lifestyle and allow other people to live a better lifestyle while diminishing the harms uh, to the environment. I, I Again, that may be right or wrong, but that's what people I love say. the phrase, techno-optimism. It's like people, they think people are going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. And so we'll just keep on doing what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi. Um, in terms of, like, following up the question about why America is so behind Europe um, in terms of environmental and energy reform, um, so why exactly is that? I mean, do you think that making measures like France just did is banning plastic bags, banning plastic silverware, things like that, on a smaller scale that people realize that it does affect their everyday thing and that they can make everyday changes, would that be something that could work here? Well, it's on the ballot in California to pay, uh, you know, plastic bags. Uh, in Washington, we have to pay for plastic bags. Um, I would not say it's had a major impact. It's had a major impact on the use of plastic bags. It has not had a major impact on, uh, on other issues. But look, I, mean, I, th I think the Europeans are, are different than we are for a whole host of reasons, um, different than Americans for the most part, um, in large part because Europeans are more progressive on these issues in general. Um, in, the, in the 2000 elections, Europeans thought that the American election was about the death penalty and they couldn't believe that anybody in America was for the death penalty. So uh, it just wasn't true in either case. But in any event, um, there just is a different attitude there. And I don't think that, I don't think that specific actions like dealing with plastic bags uh, are going to change American attitudes to make them look more like Europeans myself. But again, we'll see. Look, there are interests in, in California, something interesting to watch on the plastic bag issue. It's a big initiative. There are people on both sides of it spending lots and lots of money. Uh, and we'll see what happens. How much do energy costs and access to energy sources um, shape European attitudes, broadly speaking? You know, gas prices being higher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how much do um, attitudes toward the role of government in society affect this? What do you think? I, 
You're the you're the European expert, um, expert Mark. Uh, not really, but but that doesn't stop me from making comments. Um, <laughs> the, um, the Europeans are much. I mean, the, the gasoline prices, energy prices are much higher in Europe in general. Um, they're also, um, what was the second? Um, just their belief in the role of oh, government. Oh, government, yes. Much more likely to see a role for government. And the same is true in Canada, vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States. So both those things are sort of fundamental, fundamentally different in the political culture here. Um, but there's also just a much, uh, there's a much bigger green movement, much bigger environmental movement, green parties and so on and so forth that have been sort of spreading this gospel for some time. Uh, in various forms that we don't have here in the same way. Yes. Yeah, I'm bothered by the level of misinformation on much of the public perception on these things. For example, China is currently ahead of its targets in carbon reduction, uh, reduced coal consumption. Fracking actually produces more methane through leakage. It may actually be worse than coal. And third, uh, you mentioned the possibility of job trade-offs. It looks like uh, uh, switching over energy both has lower initial costs uh, with either solar or uh, wind power or very close to it and except for the coal plants we've got already uh, you could have a lot massive job creation uh, with that so uh, I'm wondering what we can do to increase the level of public information and has the government proposed say having a massive retraining program uh, in the coal and frac and uh, fossil fuel regions to uh, train for wind or solar? Two good questions. Yeah. Let's take the public information and awareness question um, first, because it's one that has been a thread through a lot of this data in the conversation. Americans become more informed about an issue when it becomes either a crisis or it becomes important to them for some reason. And right now, with low energy costs, it, you know, there's, there's no incentive for Americans to become more educated on that or to, to, you know, to learn more about the issue. Um, and the trade-off for wind and solar, I mean, wind and solar comprise such a small percentage of electricity generated in the country. Um, and it's not to say that, that wind power isn't, isn't extraordinarily uh, controversial in the states it's in right now. <coughs> in terms of those wind farms going up in Iowa or Texas and other places. Every, every source of energy has supporters and detractors and becomes controversial when it, becomes, when it goes into your backyard. Yeah. Well, and I would just say, you know, on your last point, people do think that, as I said, that, that uh, and Neil said, that moving to clean energy, solar, wind, et cetera, will be a job creator. So that's, people are already there. S second, um, and I, I may be getting into my own bit of controversy here, but based on what Neil said and, and what I at least read, it, it is most experts, I think, doubt the possibility that solar and wind are gonna be a huge proportion of our energy yeah. anytime in the near future. That's not true of the public. The public actually, so here's another piece of misinformation that works for our side, if you will. People do think that solar and wind could produce enough energy to uh, actually deal with our issues, even though I think most experts would say that probably isn't the case. Yeah. We'll go to your uh, question, yes. Um, I recall uh, statistics on, uh, or some numbers on how certain groups of population, let's say Latinos, black population, have, are more disproportionately more in favor of government uh, involvement in climate policy and gov direct government action. Um, is it, I'm curious if it's not the case that this uh, Republican Democratic divide that we see in these uh, newest, most recent numbers, uh, it's actually hiding or it's, in, it's uh, sort of the, the, the second stage of, of what's behind a more significant cleavage uh, within groups of population, Latinos, blacks on the one hand, other groups of population on the other hand, having very clear different opinions and not necessarily the party identification. Yeah, yeah really interesting question. Um, it is, is party identification actually masking some more complicated and interesting cleavages that exist um, in other population groups? Um, uh, that's a, I, I don't know, you know, that's a question I don't know the answer to. I mean, uh, Mark, have you looked at data that, I haven't looked at data that closely to, to break out uh, Latinos from African Americans on that. Um, but I, I mean, I, even I would at the uh, macro level of thinking that we tend to th think that these issues cut strictly along partisan lines. Um, 
And well, is that the only way they do cut? Or is that the, is that the best way for understanding how they cut? It, it's the simplest way for understanding how they cut because the truth is most Latinos and even a larger proportion of African Americans are Democrats. Yeah. So there is an underlying difference between the parties and the groups that make up the parties in terms of their trust in the role of government and so on. So there's no question about that. P Democrats are much more likely to see a role for government. Republicans much less yeah. likely to see a role for government. And that's true of Democrats as a whole. It's true of the constituent elements of the Democratic coalition. But we did uh, uh, some work uh, uh, for the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, a year or two ago in USA Today that where we gave people uh, two education plans, okay, not about energy, but education. Plan A, Plan B. We told half the sample that Plan A was the Democratic plan and Plan B was the Republican plan. Mm -hmm. And then we told the other half that Plan B was the Democratic plan and Plan A was the Republican plan. <laughs> and you know what happened? Didn't matter what the substance was. The Democrats were for the Democratic <laughs> plan, whichever one it was. Republicans were for the Republican plan, whichever one it was. The partisanship overwhelmed the substance. Well, and it's because when, when you don't have enough information, you use partisanship as a cue right. that anchors, that you, you assume that anchors your position, your, anchors your value system. Yeah. And if that's a Republican, then I'll go that way. Regardless of, and, and, and people feel that way when they don't have other, other information on an issue. But we also, I mean, I would say, I agree with that, but it's also true we have evidence that people actually change their views on issues that they do have feelings about abortion, for example, um, in, to be in line with their parties over time. Uh, how many people feel totally uplifted by that data point? <laughs> 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 All right, yes, your question. Uh, we well, we'll have time for just one or two more, I think. Well, it has been mentioned that nuclear energy could be a potentially zero emissions way for the United States to increase its energy portfolio, uh, prominence in its energy portfolio. The media perception of nuclear energy is markedly negative, in the, and it has been for the past decades due to the Chernobyl disaster, Fukushima, and perhaps rightfully so. Do you think that there is a potential way for politicians to push forth a nuclear initiative in the near future? or will that purely be decided by the free market? Well, it's it's gonna be a challenge. Um, the numbers have really only, only changed on nuclear in the past two or three years um, in terms of attitudes toward nuclear. The, the you know what the challenge for nuclear is now? The challenge for nuclear is because of the low cost of energy, uh, nuclear power plants can no longer afford to, to produce power. That they're going out of business because they can't, they, they can't afford to produce it anymore. And now they need government, you know, they need you know, incentives in the government. And that's gonna be a, a, a key issue in the upcoming congressional session. It's, if you look at, at, at all of the above kind of, uh, you know, issues, uh, energy source uh, for the country, nuclear has, is, has gotta play a significant role, and yet the future of nuclear is, is in doubt right now. Take the next question, yes. So specific to this election, and it was mentioned earlier that in heavily coal-producing communities, it's about 90-10 Republican right now because of their support for the coal industry. Do you think that, and Hillary mentioning last night, investment in clean energy, if she specifically mentioned that that investment would be tar <coughs> excuse me, targeted in those communities or the Rust Belt itself, that it would swing any of those voters? She, I mean, she has done that after she made that sort of foolish misstatement about um, uh, Un just unemploying a lot of, putting a lot of coal companies out of business and a lot of jobs, uh, destroying a lot of jobs. Um, she's talked about that. I can tell you it makes very little difference coming from a national democratic figure. Yeah, it, I agree. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> um, so I, I wonder how much the role of the media is, has in shaping how much people are concerned about the environment versus how much they talk about terrorism, for instance. Um, it's gotten, they've gotten better in the last two or three years in talking about the environment, but um, it's still on the low side, I would say, yeah. so. Yeah, we haven't talked much about the media's role in framing and <laughs> informing and, and uh, raising awareness around these issues. Yeah, Mark Hansen is in the back, and I went to graduate school with someone who wrote a, uh, a uh, paper about this that uh, showed very clearly that uh, the more the media talks about an issue, the more likely it is to be seen as an important problem, and the less likely the media is to talk about it 
the less likely it is to be seen as an important problem. So that's part one. Part two, it, media also plays a role in a more subtle and specific way. So for example, on the issue of, uh, of, of climate change, global warming, we were talking about earlier, the extent to which people believe or not that there is, that there is or is not a scientific consensus on global warming is actually very important in terms of their outlook on the issue. And the media feels an obligation to represent sort of, for reasons that are beyond me, but represent sort of equally the opponents and the proponents of that view, which is and not in proportion, not 97% to 3%, but sort of one to one. Um, and so it, it, the way the media has covered that story has created a false impression among many that there is a dissensus in the scientific community when in fact there's a very high level of consensus. The, the, the other issue is um, Americans get their information from so many different sources uh, than they did even a decade ago. Um, online, I mean, Facebook, it's just, it is, the diffusion of, of where we get our information is, is, is making it more difficult to drive it, uh, an issue and drive, uh, to raise concern about it, an individual issue because people hear so much from different sources. To raise it in the aggregate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to just underscore the point you just made, Mark, because um, just as, as, a, as a former journalist and, and someone who has been inside how even broadcast shows are produced, um, you hit on a really powerful and um, true situation that basically, um, and it's not necessarily because producers are looking to distort the reality, but they have this belief that, you know, under the guise of fairness or balance or whatever, you need to have one from each side. And therefore, what you represent are two opposing views in equal proportion. You represent polarity. You don't represent nuance and proportionality. And I do think on a range of issues, but including climate change, um, you see a distorting effect um, in the way those, those segments are carried out. All right, we'll do one last quick question right here, and then we'll wrap. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so there are two numbers in here that I was looking at. One of them saying that 8 in 10 say they would like the United States to work toward reducing greenhouse gas emissions based on the Paris Agreement. But then compared to 65% uh, of Americans think climate change is the problem that the government needs to address. So of course, I don't know how uh, comparable those numbers are, but I'm curious uh, to see what you guys think about the potency of attaching climate change to issues that people do care more about, for example, foreign policy or America not losing face in light of international events. So. Um, it's going to have more potency by connecting it to domestic issues and foreign policy issues, by far. I mean, Amer Americans are only engaged in foreign policy issues initially because of the terrorism issue and because of trade. Um, this is, uh, the more we can connect it to jobs, health, um, issues here at home, the, the more traction it's going to get. Issues that speak to a community level or an individual level of, of importance, yeah. essentially. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I want to thank and have you join me in thanking Mark Melman and Neil Newhouse for this conversation today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank We've you. learned a lot about this issue. I greatly thank you. My thanks also to Michael Greenstone, Sam Ori, and the entire team at Epic. We greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity to collaborate on this. Thank you all so much for being here. We encourage you to check out future IOP events online at politics.uchicago.edu. Thanks again and have a great evening.